Well, good morning to you, and as always, a very warm welcome to our worship of God here at Gilcomson Church. My name is Jerry Middleton. I'm one of the elders here, and delighted to extend that warm welcome to you. And uh, for those of you visiting, I hope you've already received a warm welcome. Those of you joining us online as well, we're delighted to welcome you in this manner too, and pray that the Lord would bless you and uh, afford you his comfort, strength, and help as you share with us in our worship this morning. Let's then join with one another to sound out the praise of God in the words of one of the paraphrases that reminds us of that great God that we have and all that he's done for us in Jesus. Blessed be the everlasting God, the Father of our Lord. Let us worship God. a seat. Let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Almighty God, we're always glad as we come around to another Sunday to have the opportunity to gather once again and to join our hearts in song and sound out your praise and in the very singing of your praise to be reminded of all that you are, all that you've done, all that you've promised to us in the person of your risen Son. We thank you, gracious God, that you are that everlasting God. You've always been, you always will be, you remain the same, the one great constant in a world of continuing flux and change and uncertainty. And how glad we are that this is indeed your world. You made it, you run it, and in the love that you have for it, you have come to it in the person of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in order to address the deepest needs that we have, and to resolve all the issues that lie before us. We thank you that you are indeed wonderfully wise. We praise you for your goodness and your greatness. We praise you that you are a God of enormous power. There is nothing that is too hard for you. We're glad of that because often we find our circumstances such that it feels like we're banging our heads against the brick wall, able to get nowhere, seeing no solutions. And we praise you that you are the God who is able to bring things into being out of nothing, the God who shines light into the darkness, the God who brings order into our chaos. And we're therefore glad once again to repair to yourself, to humbly come before you and bow and acknowledging our need of your forgiveness because all of us have got it wrong in our lives. We make a mess one way or another. We sin against you. We, uh, and in the words that we say, the things that we do, the choices that we make, the attitudes that we adopt in 
countless different ways we sin against yourself. And so we come humbly before you to seek your forgiveness, thanking you that you have come in Jesus Christ to address that need, to give to us a new start, to make us new people, to give to us a whole new future. And how we thank you, therefore, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for all that he has accomplished in his life and death and resurrection and ascension on high. And we thank you, living God, that through what he has done, forgiveness is now made possible through the work of your Holy Spirit. That's been applied to our lives that we may enjoy that forgiveness and know that friendship with yourself. And we'd ask simply for the help of your Holy Spirit as we join in worship this morning, that it may in all regards be pleasing and honoring to yourself. And we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. When we turn to the scripture, uh, Roger is going to come and read the scripture for us. And uh, from Romans chapter 8, you have the words on the screen. Roger's going to come and read. Good morning. Our reading today is from Paul's letter to the Romans, and it'll be chapter 8, verses 18 to 21. Uh, If you have one of the church Bibles from the back there, it's uh, page 1135, 1135. Hear the word of the Lord. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation that was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Amen. Great, thanks Roger. Um, We're we're gonna have a a little think about that now. And we're gonna start with this, and I, I wonder if any of you know what that is called, what these are called. Do you know what that's called? What is it called? Scales. Scales, that's quite right. Quite often people nowadays have kind of electronic ones. You just press a button and things like that, and, and uh, that's how you weigh things. But in the olden days, certainly they used to kind of weigh things by using these scales. And it's that sort of thing that Paul is on about um, in the, the verses that Roger read. And what he's doing is he is kind of weighing two things together. And the first of them is something that we're all familiar with. Um, Bad things happen in our lives, all right? Um, We don't go looking for them. We don't want them, but they happen to us. And here are some of them. So disappointment. Uh, Do you know what what, what would be something that is disappointing for you? Something that is disappointing. I I, I hesitate to ask you, Sam, but I'll ask you. That's, that's putting it nice and politely, yeah. Um, uh, people going out of a football tournament, all right? And um, we, we didn't dwell too much on that because some countries have already gone out of the tournament and it's kind of disappointing. Yep, that would be disappointing. Yeah, and Scotland losing to Hungary. This is kind of um, just rubbing the salt in the wound now. But uh, yeah, things happen, kind of bad things happen that, that sometimes disappoint us. Uh, sometimes we come up against people who are bullies or who don't like us and who make life hard for us and who kind of say things that uh, kind of hurt us and uh, can hit us and things like that. And sometimes you come across people like that and it's, that's not nice. We, we don't like things like that that happen. Sometimes we get sad and uh, all sorts of things make us sad, not just football related things but they can make us sad as well uh, all sorts of things make us sad and sometimes it's it's just really really sore uh, the the sadness that there is sometimes we get ill and we feel rotten and uh, yeah and you've been ill the last couple of weeks 
Any of you been ill? Some of you have been ill in the past couple of weeks. It's not nice when you just kind of got a sore head and you feel rotten and you feel a sore throat or you've got a cough and, and you just want to kind of crawl under your duvet and, uh, and just uh, uh, go to sleep and things like that. You feel rotten like that. And um, None of us like being ill. And uh, sometimes we, we have, along with the illness, we get a lot of pain, we get uh, hurt, we get bruises, we get cuts and uh, things like that. And uh, that can be pretty sore, and none of us like the pain either. And, and all these things Paul is writing about, he says, uh, in this world, um, a lot of bad things happen, and he packages them all together and uses one word, that is the word suffering, kind of puts them all in a big bag and uh, puts them into this bag and says, uh, our present sufferings. And there's a whole load of stuff that uh, we don't like, bad things that happen, disappointment, uh, enemies, illness, pain, etc., etc. And put them in a bag. And what's going to happen if you put that bag on the scale? What's going to happen? Any ideas? What is going to happen? You put that bag on the scales. Uh, Matthew, what's going to happen? It's going to go like that. That's right. Let's have a look. See, um, that's what happens. It's going to weigh it down because uh, uh, a lot of bad things like that all packaged there. One disappointment after another, one illness after another, one pain after another, one sorrow after another. Um, uh, you put them all together. Think, Whoa, what a weight this is. It's just kind of weighing down on us like that. And, and so it kind of is, is a pretty heavy thing to have to cope with in our lives like that. He's saying, yeah, uh, that's what happens. Uh, bad things, um, they, they kind of feel like a, a weight that just press on down upon us. But he's saying, we also need to think about the things that are going to be coming. And uh, that's what he then goes on to. There's a new world coming. Uh, we're going to get a new body. And it's uh, going to be a world where we uh, are enjoying the presence of Jesus uh, in a wonderful new way. That, he says, is what's coming. And uh, that he, he, he calls simply glory. Um, that's what's coming, and he calls it glory. And he's uh, thinking to himself, so if we were to put the glory on the other side of the scale, because those are all good things, there's a new world coming, then all of a sudden the whole thing tips up. And what he's saying is that the glory that is to come uh, the, uh, the new world that God is going to bring into being, the new bodies that we're going to have, the presence of Jesus with us all the time. We're going to enjoy being with him and serving with him and doing things with him and, and sharing it with the whole company of God's people forever and ever because we're not going to uh, get tired. We're not going to get old. We're not going to, uh, to uh, have any sort of pain or anything like that. We're going to be able to enjoy that. And he's saying that, that completely outweighs all the suffering that there might be in the present world. And that's what he's on about there. And so he's, he's reminding us that the glory that is to come, and we'll bring the next picture up for you, the glory that is to come is infinitely better than what uh, we presently have to endure and what we have to suffer. And, and that's what he means us to understand that although things are sometimes really hard in the here and now, uh, we have to keep reminding ourselves that, that something better is coming. God has promised that something better is coming. He will make sure it does come like that, and it will be absolutely wonderful, what uh, the Bible calls glory. And, and that's, that is the, the biggest thing of all, the best thing of all, and uh, a new world, new bodies, and above all, we have Jesus himself present with us. And the song that I thought we would sing, therefore, before you head off out to, to Sunday school this morning, is a song that reminds us of that and invites us all to come and enjoy uh, being with Jesus in the here and now, leading on to what is to come. Come on, come in, everybody. Let's uh, sing this to God's praise.
So the, uh, the words of the song there, uh, come on you saints, keep believing. Sometimes we just need that exhortation. Uh, we need Sunday by Sunday to hear God speaking. And always it is pointing us forward and saying whatever the present may be, uh, God has in store for his people something that is altogether better. Let's then join in prayer as we continue in our worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we're glad to return our thanks to you for all your goodness to us. Glad of the opportunity simply to pause in lives where often we're, we're that busy and so many other things occupy our times, so many other things as a distraction to us that we fail to recognize the countless different ways in which you intimate to us your care for us, your knowledge of us, and your desire to do us good. Sometimes we find it hard, our gracious God, and the world in which we live, all that's going on out there in the wider world, so much that's perplexing, so much that's distressing, so much that's confusing, so much that seems so unfair, and in our own lives as well, when we have to cope with disappointment, when we find tensions in our relationships and sometimes uh, real hostility being directed towards us, when we experience sorrow, and loss, when we find ourselves going down with illness and having to endure pain, we acknowledge humbly, living God, we, we don't find any of that easy. Sometimes we wonder in uh, the extended period where it seems one thing after another just keeps on happening, bad things. We wonder where you are. We wonder what's going on. And that would be true, living God, for many gathered here, many who join us online as well, their circumstances such that they'd love to be here, but are simply unable to be here. And so we thank you, living God, for the honesty with which in your word you remind us that so very often uh, there is that pattern where we are bidden simply to trust you, that you are there with us in the midst of things, even when it is so dark and so difficult. And we thank you for the narrative of so many different individuals where you remind us that once we read to the end of the story, then in hindsight, we're able to recognize what has been going on and why there has been that delay. And so we thank you that you have given to us the end of the story by pointing us forward to all that now is guaranteed through the coming of Jesus, your son, and through the ministry that he exercised. And we thank you, living God, that there is guaranteed to your people that new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. And we praise you, gracious God, for the confidence you give to us that in and through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, now risen from the dead, you have given to us the guarantee that we also, beyond death, shall indeed be raised to eternal life as we are found in him. And so we thank you, Lord God, for the urgency with which you address that summons to us to ensure that we are indeed in Christ, that we are in relationship with your risen Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that uh, we know him and he knows us. We pray, Lord God, that by your Holy Spirit, you would indeed open our eyes more and more to the great glorious reality of his person and his presence, that we might delight more and more in all that he has accomplished and be enabled to press on in the confidence that his eye is indeed always on us and he is leading his people forward through the darkest of valleys and will bring us one day finally into his own nearer presence. And so we pray, Lord God, for those who are um, experiencing sorrow at this time, those who've been bereaved. Thank you that their grief is one that is known in all its details and in all its depths by yourself, better than any. And we pray that you would comfort them 
and afford them that sense of your own day-by-day -day sustaining of them through the void and through the pain and the ache of that grief that is theirs. We pray for those who are ill, living God, some with chronic conditions, some uh, newly diagnosed with a condition that is serious or terminal, and wondering how to handle that, having to come to terms with what will be a, a very different pattern from what they had anticipated and hoped for. Pray that you would indeed stretch forth your hand and lay your gracious hand upon them, that there may indeed be healing grace and power imparted to them from on high, that you would afford them your peace, the confidence that you will indeed continue to be with them through all that coming days will bring. Some living God who are experiencing great pain, some experiencing great loss, some experience great difficulty in their home situations, in their work situations, whatever the need may be, we pray, Lord God, that you would multiply your grace towards them, even as we remember them in our hearts before you. We thank you, living God, that you are uh, so well able to stretch forth your hand into the very depths of our need, whatever it may be, even as you reached down into the slavery of your people in Egypt and delivered them marvelously from that when, humanly speaking, there could be no expectation of that. And we thank you that you continue through the power of your Holy Spirit to reach into our circumstances the enslavement that comes with sin in so many different regards, and you come to set us free from that, to deliver us from the power of sin, to break its grip upon our lives and to release us into a new life. And how we pray, Lord God, for those different arenas of conflict throughout the world in which we live, that you would speak that word that will bring about change there, that will afford peace in the place of the turmoil of war. And we pray for all who strive to that end, living God, and ask that you would be pleased to prosper their labors as they seek to apply their leadership responsibilities in a way that will issue in a just peace for all. And we pray for our own lands these days, our God, with a general election looming now on the horizon of this coming new week. And pray, Lord God, please, your kind mercy upon us as a nation. For we have strayed far from you. We have gone our own way. We have spurned your word. We have rejected your son. And we have presumed to live in our own strength, by our own wisdom, and for our own ends. And we can only cry to you, living God, for your mercy. You are the sovereign God, sovereign over the nations. And all government is ultimately only a delegated authority. And we appeal to yourself, the highest authority. Have mercy upon our land, we pray you. And be pleased in these coming days, so to order our circumstances, that those uh, those circumstances shall indeed ultimately redound to your praise and glory, serving to point the men and women and girls and boys of our society to your risen Son as the one who is King, the one upon whose shoulders true government now rests, the one who is wise, the one who is strong, the one who is kind, the one who is good. Lord God, come by your Holy Spirit and direct the minds and hearts of the peoples of this land to your risen Son as the one in whom alone is life. We pray, Lord God, that as we turn ourselves to your word this morning, you would speak through your word by your Spirit to each of our hearts and apply its truth to our lives in a way that will be to your glory and will issue in transformed living. 
So hear us in our prayers, Lord God, and in all the unspoken prayers of our hearts that we bring before you this day as we ask them all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, before we turn again to the scripture, we're going to sing to God's praise a hymn that's not uh, inappropriate for the passage we're looking at in Romans chapter 8. See what a morning. Well, the uh, message this morning is simply entitled Waiting, and I imagine that that resonates with absolutely every single one of us, because all of us are familiar with the whole sad task of having to wait. None of us like waiting, and in the age in which we live that is very much an instant age, uh, it is right against the grain. We, we do not like to have to wait speaking with a guy on Wednesday who is seeking to find work. He has been looking, he has been waiting, he has been applying, a uh, fit and very able guy with uh, a lot of expertise and applying here, applying there. And in the course of the past year or so, uh, 612 applications and 612 applications come back negative. Uh, he informs me this morning it's now up to 620. And, and that's hard when you are, you are trying this door, trying that door, trying the next door, and you are waiting uh, to see some door opening and wondering as you apply and as you wait, wondering whether, whether God has actually forgotten about you at all. And uh, one of the things that the Bible does is it reminds us from really page one that, that God is never in a hurry. Um, God knows the time scales. God is not in a rush. God is not panicked. He knows what he's doing. And accordingly, very often, his people do, it seems, have to wait. And so we find Noah. Uh, everyone knows about Noah. And it's not hard, not easy being Noah, building an ark uh, miles from any sort of water at all, exposed to the ridicule of all sorts of people who come along and say, um, you know, what on earth are you doing building an ark when you are not near any water, when there's no sign of any water like that? What are you? And he's saying, well, you know, um, it's coming. 
And uh, a year later, he's saying, it, it is coming, and who knows how long, no one knows quite how long it was that it took him to build the ark and how long it was before the floods actually came. We simply know that it was in his 600th year, and the immediately prior reference was he was 500, and, and so somewhere in that sort of time span, the guy is building an ark and, and just, well, kind of waiting for the water to come because God has said it is coming. Um, Abram is the same. Abram was given an astonishing promise that he and his wife, who were not able to have any children, that God would indeed give them a child. He was 75 years old when the promise was made, and it is some 25 years down the line. And when you are 75 to start with, and you get that sort of promise, and year after year after year, there is no indication at all of that promise being fulfilled, you do begin to wonder, uh, did God really mean it? Did I hear him correctly? What on earth is going on? And, and he is having to wait. And all the time God is saying, wait. And as you run through the Old Testament, you find that's, that's invariably the pattern of all these guys. Moses is waiting. Joseph is having to wait. David is having to wait. All the way through the scriptures, these guys are having to wait sometimes a long, 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 long time. And, and it is writ large through the scriptures that that is part and parcel of the faith that God calls us to exercise because it is a future-oriented faith. It is a faith that is looking up but is also looking forward and looking forward to all that God has promised. And God is saying, listen, trust me, I know the time skills, I know what I'm doing, and, and I am going to do what I've said. Wait. Wait for it and keep believing, keep trusting, and keep on hanging in there. And that is essentially what these verses in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25, are underlining for us. They are about waiting. And you'll see, uh, even in terms of the, uh, the language that is used, verse 19, the creation waits in eager expectation. Uh, verse 23, uh, we too groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. And then verse 25, if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And that's very much um, the, the thrust of it. It is the exhortation to wait. Um, and, and we're going to explore really what Paul has to say here. Um, first of all, why, then for what we are waiting, and then how we are waiting. That's essentially what these verses are on about. And, and it is a constant exhortation of Scripture to, to wait for the Lord. Uh, Psalm 27, for instance, um, at verse 19, uh, verse 13, rather, I remain confident of this, the psalmist says, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Um, it may be that for some of you here this morning, those two verses are God's word for you. Um, God knows each and every one of us. He knows our circumstances. He knows the burdens on our hearts. And as we come to worship him, we come eagerly looking to him to speak into our lives his word for our situation and for our circumstances. And it may well be that that's his word for some of you from Psalm 27. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I took a note um, as I was preparing of uh, the, the words that Jeremiah is given by the Lord to, to deliver to the exiles. These are people who had messed up good and proper in life. And as a result of their persistent and radical disobedience to God, they're getting it wrong, they're messing up in life. Uh, they had ended up um, miles away from where God had located them in the promised land. They are now miles away in exile in a strange land, a, a difficult land, uh, a, a very a strange culture, a very different culture. They don't like being there. They don't want to be there, but they know why they're there. And uh, it would be easy for them to become dispirited. And Jeremiah is the means by which God addresses them. And God says through Jeremiah, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And there is a sense in which um, 
Um, that, is, that, is, that is what the whole Bible, um, what it's whole, the whole Bible's message is. The promise of God, I will come to you. And I will come to you in order to bring you back home. And the plans that I have for you are plans to do you good, not harm, plans to give you hope and a future. And uh, that on the, the kind of wide canvas of the whole uh, of history, that's what God is about. I'll come to you and I'm coming to bring you home. And when Jesus does come, he says, no, I'm going ahead of you and I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring you back with me because I'm taking you home. And the plans that God has in and through Jesus Christ are essentially to bring us home and they were to give to us whatever our circumstances are at present, to give to us a hope and a future. And the, the opening verses of this passage uh, are along those lines where Paul is saying, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's future, in other words. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Something's going to happen up in the future that's kind of like the, the unveiling, finally, of a statue. Um, except even more wonderful in that it's not some uh, static three-dimensional block of stone or anything like that. It is the reality of what God has done in the lives of ordinary messed up individuals in transforming them by the power of his spirit into the very likeness of Jesus until they are conformed fully to the very likeness of Jesus. And, and that's what's going to be unveiled. That's what's going to be revealed. That's what the future is holding. And, and the whole of creation is, is waiting for that moment when at last humanity will be what it was meant to be in the very beginning and uh, has signally failed to be. And, and it is future directed. And uh, the whole of creation looking forward to that. And Paul is saying, and what's coming totally outweighs whatever you may have to be going through at the moment. However hard it may be, however sore it may be, however sad it may be, however dark it may be, um, what is coming uh, pales that into insignificance. It is infinitely greater, infinitely more glorious than whatever you may be suffering at the moment. And he goes on there in verse um, um, verses, th these opening verses to, to explain why um, we have to wait. I don't know if you ever sang as a child, um, you know, to the, uh, the tune of, uh, Oh, come all you faithful. Why are we waiting? You know that one? Yeah. Why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? Um, we used to sing that a lot just because we were fed up with waiting. Uh, and it, it expresses exactly why, uh, you know, how we're feeling. Why? Why are we waiting? Uh, and you find in the scripture that the, the psalmists are, are not afraid to ask God that question. How long? Um, have you forgotten about us? Why, why are you not doing something? Why have you not intervened? Why, why are we having to wait so long for that? And it may well be that that's the question on your heart and your mind. Why? Why am I having to wait? Why, why have I not got a job? Why has the, the way forward not opened up for me? And uh, it's, it's a very real question. And Paul, to some extent, is addressing that here in uh, these verses. And, and what he says is essentially these, these kind of three uh, primary points that I've put on the screen for you there so that you at least get the, the general gist. The first thing that we have to be aware of is the sovereignty of God. Um, what is going on in history, what is going on in, in the history of our lives is under the sovereignty of God. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That's to say there is a God who is ordering the circumstances of history. A God who knows what he's doing, a God who has a plan, a God who is not making it up as he goes along, but a God who from all eternity had a plan that was altogether glorious and altogether great, that found its focus in the person of his son Jesus, and will issue one day in a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells that will leave us and the whole of creation saying, wow, uh, wow, how wonderful you are, how glorious you are, how wise you are, how good you are, how mighty you are. Um, and, and God knows what he's doing, the sovereignty of God, the creation was subjected by that God who knows what he's doing. So that's the first thing to bear in mind. There's a God 
who all is our circumstances, and even if you haven't a clue what is going on, he does. He knows what he's doing, and he is saying always, trust me, and that's one of the reasons why the whole scripture is designed to point you to God, to who he is, what he's done, so that you would learn that he's altogether trustworthy. He's wise, he's good, he's kind, he's strong, he knows what he's doing. That's the first thing. Second thing that is pointed to here is the gravity of sin. Sin has its repercussions. It has its consequences. And from the very beginning, uh, God himself made that clear. The day you eat the fruit of that tree, you will die. There, there is a consequence. And in a moral universe, a universe that has been framed by the righteous God and functions on moral grounds, um, our sin when we choose to go our own way, when we rebel against the one who is rightly the king, that has consequences. And the consequences are uh, spelled out in these verses here in terms of, first of all, frustration. That's part of the consequence of sin. You go your own way, it doesn't work because it's not God's way. The way the, the creation is designed to work, God has laid it out. This is, this is how it works. The, the maker's instructions are what we have in the Bible. And, and when you choose to do it your own way, um, it doesn't work. And it's frustrating because it doesn't work. And God says, well, yeah, that's, that's what happens when you do it your way. And so we, we find and we experience that frustration in all sorts of different ways. We experience it physically, when uh, we find that we're, we're not able to do what we, we thought we were able to do. We experience it mentally when our, our minds begin to go and we can't remember. You know, we, we kind of knew what the person's name was yesterday and for the life of me, I can't remember what the person's name is. I, 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 I woke up through the night last night and I was, I was madly trying to think of, of someone's name. And I, I, I knew exactly what the name was um, yesterday, and blow me, could I, could I remember what the, the person's name was? And I was, I was kind of thinking, how on earth, how could I have forgotten what it is? And, it, and it's frustrating when you, you know who the person is, and yet you, you can't locate them. Um, we experience that frustration relationally, we experience it vocationally, we experience it in the context of our work, in the context of our relationships with others, we experience frustration in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we're disappointed by other people, disappointed by our circumstances. We are frustrated, and don't tell me that that's not a common experience. It may well be exactly how you are this morning, frustrated to the point of almost of exploding with frustration. And, and God says, well, yeah, that's, that's what happens when sin comes into the world. It becomes a very frustrating world in which we live. Genesis chapter 3 underlines that, that uh, the whole business of, of cultivating the land um, is frustrating. When we lived down in the south of uh, Argyle, there was, uh, we had quite a large vegetable patch, uh, and it was hugely frustrating. It took me about uh, a whole week to clear out all the weeds that there were, and by the time I'd finished, the weeds had started growing back in because we lived next door to the farmer's field and the thistles came in and all sorts of other stuff came in and they just kind of planted themselves down. It was like painting the fourth bridge. Uh, it, it just was just an ongoing thing. It was hugely frustrating trying to, trying to cultivate that small little patch of land to make something grow out of it. And, and it is frustrating. That's the first word that Paul uses here to describe the gravity of sin um, the world in which we live has become a complicated world. It's become a frustrated world. The second word that he uses is that of enslavement or bondage, the bondage to decay. Uh, you see there towards the, uh, the end of the, uh, the, the passage that uh, Roger read, verse 21, will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Um, that's part and parcel of what sin does in the world. Not only does it bring frustration, it also brings an enslavement. And so we, we become trapped by and enslaved to patterns of conduct that are, that are themselves damaging um, and very easily become addictive and addictions that get us in their grip and it is, it is extremely difficult to break out of them. Um, it is a bondage. So you have frustration, you have enslavement, and you have disintegration or decay. 
um, and there is something essentially disintegrative. That's to say it, it, uh, it uh, pushes things apart, breaks things apart in uh, the, uh, the, the direct contrast to the living God who, who brings things together. Sin is disintegrative. And, and those are the three terms that Paul uses. That's the world in which we live that is marked by frustration, enslavement, and disintegration. And uh, that's the, the kind of second part of the reason why uh, we are called upon to wait. God is, is, is having to fix something that is seriously broken and flawed. Um, I've, I've told you before um, the, the, the narrative of an experience I had when I was uh, a student at university back in 1972, it must have been. And, uh, and I was playing football one evening, and um, I, I got a very bad tackle um, just on the, you know, on the, in the kind of nice summer's evening in June 1972, playing out on the meadows in Edinburgh with a whole crowd of, uh, of guys, and it was a serious tackle. I mean, the guy meant business, and, and I thought the moment he, he tackled me, I thought he's broken my leg. It was that, that sharp a pain. Uh, I realized um, fairly rapidly I hadn't broken my leg because I could stand up and things like that. And, and it was just a, a, a nasty bruise. But six weeks later, out of the blue, uh, one evening, it started throbbing and then it started swelling. And then it kept on doing both of those things that evening in a way that became excruciatingly painful. Um, getting bigger and bigger and more and more painful until I was crying my eyes out quite literally and, and crying out in agony. And the doctor comes and, and takes a look at it and he says, well, I'm not going to do anything. And I say to him, you are a doctor. That's your job. You are meant to do something. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything at the minute. And I said, you, you've got to do something. I am in pain. You can see you've got two eyes still. You can see it is hugely swollen. I'm telling you it is massively painful. He said, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to ask you a question, though. He said, um, within the last two, three, four years, he said, have you, have you cut yourself and has that cut got infected? And I kind of cast my eye back and I said, well, yes. said, I, you know, I, I worked uh, on a farm uh, a couple of summers back and I, I did uh, cut myself. Oh, I'll not tell you where, but I'm, I'll point to where it was. Uh, I cut myself uh, straddling some barbed wire and it was rusty barbed wire. And yes, it was infected and I won't tell you all that happened thereafter. And he said, well, that's your problem. For the last three years, he says, your body has been a poison making factory. And you didn't realize what was going on in your body, but it has been making poison over the course of the past three years. I mean, it was horrific. It was something out of a, a kind of a horror film that he was describing for me. Your body has been manufacturing poison and pumping that poison all the way through your body. And what has happened when you, when you had that tackle, it was like Armageddon got announced in your body. And, and all the poison in your whole body decided it was now time to converge on this one point in your life leg that's what's been happening he said but but all the poison hasn't gathered there quite yet that's why I'm waiting trust me he said I'm a doctor now now usually I do trust doctors um, because they they know their stuff um, and and I was really put on the spot because uh, every single part of me said listen if I was a doctor I'd, I'd be doing something serious about this right now and he's saying no I'm a real doctor you're just a quack um, I'm a real doctor trust me on this I know what I'm doing if I if I try to start doing something with it now um, I'm not going to solve your problem I want to solve your problem I don't want you to come back in another three years with the same problem all over again. I need to get the whole stuff out of your system. So I'm going to wait, he said, and I'm going to ask you to wait. And uh, here, he said, um, here's some paracetamol. You know, like, like that was going to help me. But uh, it kind of did, I suppose. But he said, I'm going to come back in three days' time. And he came back in three days' time. And uh, if you are squeamish, I suggest you just kind of block your ears for just a moment or two. Because he came back to the house with a scalpel. And, and he did the business. No anesthetic or anything. And I, 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 I'm not going to, uh, to, to tell you what it was that he, he pulled out of my leg, but it was big, and it was scary, and it was poison. And he was saying, wait. Sometimes you need to wait because I want to deal with this properly. God, who is sovereign, takes the gravity of sin, which is a poison, rightly and he says you're going to have to wait so that I can deal with it fully and finally 
And along with that is the, the certainty of hope. When the Bible speaks about waiting in hope, it is not talking about what Sam and Matthew are talking about, where they hope Scotland will win the Euros. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Um, I, I learned that a long, long time ago. Uh, I've stood on the terraces of Hampden Park in Glasgow in the days when you, you had terraces where you were allowed to stand and where they jam-packed um, thousands upon thousands in. It was a crowd of about 85,000, and that was, that was small because Hampden those days took 120,000 and that sort of thing. But it was just like sardines in a tin. And, and we drew with what was then West Germany, and I was over the moon. I thought, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to win the whole, the whole World Cup next time around. And and, um, you know, when, when uh, Scotland went off to Argentina with uh, Ali McLeod and Ali's army, like they going on, we were going to win the World Cup. We, we kind of had that great hope, that surging hope. Um, that's not what the Bible is talking about. That's kind of rootless, hopeless uh, hope that, that we have. This is, this is solid hope. This is guaranteed. And uh, the, the guarantee of Scotland winning the World Cup and things like that is, is just non-existent. This is a guaranteed hope that the Bible is always speaking about. Guaranteed because of who God is, and what God has done, and what God has promised to us. It is absolutely dead cert. It is the hope that a child has on Christmas Eve when that stocking goes up at the end of the bed. That's the sort of hope that it is. That stocking is going to be filled. And when they wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, they, they see that it's there. They know that it's there, but they, they don't know what's inside it. They, they haven't got their hands on it, but they, they know that it's there. And they are hoping uh, that, uh, that there will be in the morning something good. And, and it's that sort of hope. They, they know that there will be that. Now, that's what verses 18 to 21 are on about. Uh, the reason why we have to hope. Uh, to have to wait. The sovereignty of God, he knows what he's doing. He's ordering all things well uh, in the context of the gravity of sin, where it is a serious, serious problem, poison in the system of the world. And, and God has said, but trust me, trust me. Uh, I know what I'm doing and I will deal with the whole thing. And verses 22, 23, then take it on and address the question of, uh, for what are we waiting and it's a good question, and uh, we didn't read it with the children, uh, but we'll read it now. We'll put the words on the screen for you. Uh, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, that's to say God has, has given us his Holy Spirit, so we, we know in some small measures, kind of down payment or deposit that's been given to us, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies." Now, that's, that's um, Paul addressing the question of what it is that we are waiting for. What is it up ahead that is that big, that good, that it completely outweighs any amount of suffering in the here and now? And you don't need me to tell you that there is uh, that much suffering in the here and now in terms of the pain and the sorrow, the grief, the disappointments, the animosity, the hostility, the hurt, the turmoil, etc. There is that amount of suffering in the here and now. It is going to be pretty big, pretty good in order to completely outweigh all of that because that's heavy stuff, the suffering that there is in the world in which we live. Um, you only need to, to see what is going on in Ukraine, see what is going on in Gaza, see what is going on in so many countries where they are devastated by, by disaster, they are ravaged by poverty, where uh, all sorts of, of wretched stuff goes on, the cruelty that there is, the, the hostility that there is, the, uh, the tragedies that there are, the pain that there is in the world in which we live, quite apart from our own personal circumstances. It is heavy, heavy stuff that are present sufferings, and yet Paul says... Uh, uh, that is as nothing compared to what is coming. That's really heavy, what is coming. That is, that is really substantial, really weighty. So we, we do well to ask, so, so what is it? And um, he gives two main answers here. Um, the first is the analogy of childbirth. It's kind of like that, he says. Not that as a man he would, he would know that reality from the inside, as it were, well, yeah, I mean, as, as an individual, he would know it from the inside. 
because all of us have been inside. And that's, that's the kind of point. Um, one of the things that I regret um, is that when I was an embryo in my mother's womb, I didn't have a notebook to be able to kind of write down what it, what it was like. Um, I just thought it was great. So great that I, I didn't kind of think about uh, there being anything any better at all. It was, it was warm, it was safe, there was food on demand, it was, you know, everything that a, a boy could look for and, and, and like. It was just wonderful, but I have I've no particular recollection of it. But I, but I recognize that, that in my mother's womb, it must have seemed like, yeah, this is, this is it, you know, uh, life. Because as an embryo, I, I had all my senses, I, I could feel pain, I could hear noises, um, and uh, I, I, I recognize that because um, um, I, I remember in, in Edinburgh there was uh, a, a lady who, who was pregnant and um, she would sit there with a child and uh, whenever I started speaking, the child started kind of um, playing along with the rhythm of, of what I was saying and boom, 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 you know, the, the little kind of kicks inside and, and when I would stop then the child would stop in, in, in the womb and then um, when, when the, the baby was born, um, it was kind of like the baby recognized my voice, you know, and she would bring the child into church and it was fine, yeah, God, I'm familiar with this guy um, uh, from inside the womb type of thing, um, but it's that sort of picture inside the womb, uh, the, the embryo thinks that there could not be anything better than this. This is, this is good enough. It's safe and it's warm and it's, it's, um, it's nourishing and it's, it's growing. And, and, and what more could there possibly be? Because an embryo hasn't a clue. But, but obviously when the, the embryo is born, wow, it's, it's a whole new world. I, I didn't realize it was that big a world. I, I didn't realize that that expands of a universe. I didn't realize what it was to be able to see or to hear the way that I'm now hearing like that. Um, that's the, the first analogy that Paul is using. It's going to kind of be a little bit like that. You may think this is, this is quite good, the things that you're able to enjoy in the world now, the people that you're able to enjoy being with, the places that you enjoy going to and the fun that you have there and the things that you end up doing in all these different places. Uh, it's all good and you enjoy these things. You have a load of good memories and, and those memories, uh, you think, yeah, what, what could be better than that? I would that I was back there and being able to go to that place and see those people and enjoy doing those things and so on and so forth. And and what could be better, we, we think, but, but God says, listen, it, it, that's kind of just a, like being in the womb. Um, this, this, is, this is just a, a small foretaste, as it were, of what is to come. And all those places, all those people, all those memories that you have of those things that, uh, that you, you so enjoy, they are just really like a kind of mirror, a kind of dark glass in which you see vaguely what the future uh, is holding out for us. Um, that's the first picture that Paul uses. That's what we're waiting for. Uh, we're waiting really to be for the first time actually uh, alive and kicking outside the womb as uh, an embryo in the womb. A real person becomes a wholly new dimension to the person that they are once they are born. Uh, kind of like that, says Paul, on the one hand, and then he becomes more specific when he speaks about our adoption as sons and speaks about the redemption of our bodies. Um, this is what we look forward to. You are not going to be um, some sort of uh, um, nebulous spirit floating around in space with a kind of harp somehow uh, being held by you. Uh, you are going to be uh, a person combining your spirit and your body, and your body will at last be perfected. There will be no more pain. There will be no more weakness. There will be no more tiredness. There will be nothing that hinders and harms and hurts. There will be nothing that holds you back so that all your capacities, all your facilities, all your, your senses heighten beyond measure. Um, Susan had a cataract operation a few weeks ago and uh, for one eye. And one of the striking things um, after the operation, she said, oh, um, I didn't realize that was white. She just got it a dull, dull kind of cream color. She said, wow, that is so white. 
all of a sudden her, her capacity to see, she just kind of assumed it was a kind of dull cream. And, and no, it's not, it's bright white. Her, her sight has suddenly been increased, that capacity, that sharpness, that, that, that ability to see what is really there. And, and that's part of our being, uh, our bodies being redeemed. At last, we are able to see things as they really are. Um, and the Bible kind of ends on that note. We will see Jesus. We will see his face. You and I simply could not cope with seeing his face in the here and now. I remember what happened to the Apostle Paul when the Lord Jesus revealed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus, and the guy is thrown to the ground, and he is blinded. He, he cannot, cannot see the sheer stunning beauty and glory of the eternal Son of God who has been his Savior. Cannot see that. His body cannot cope with that. But the day's coming when, when he will, when we will as well. We will see our Savior. We will see his face. Hallelujah. We will, we will have that capacity. That's just our eyes. And our ears will begin to hear in a way that we have never, ever heard before. We, we kind of think we, we've got reasonable hearing, it may be. Some of you have a hearing aid. But, uh, you, you know, even if you've got kind of wax in your ears and, and, and all of a sudden that gets syringed and, and the wax is removed, suddenly you think, whoa, I'm, I'm hearing things now that I hadn't heard before. And, and our hearing intensified and amplified in, in a way that we, 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 we simply cannot begin to imagine. Every single uh, faculty in us, our capacity to do things, our capacity to enjoy things, uh, our capacity at last to be able to be the people God means us to be with bodies that are at last strengthened and enabled to do so, able to serve God, able to enjoy God, able to worship God, able to delight in being with God, able to share with him in what he is doing. We will be redeemed, our bodies made perfect. That's what we're looking forward to. Uh, in the here and now, our bodies, we, we enjoy being able to, to kind of move around and do things and see things and hear things and taste things and, and smell things and so on. Uh, we, we enjoy all of that. We enjoy all the different activities that we're able to be involved in, but they are as nothing to what is yet to come. And uh, that's, that's what we look forward to. Uh, because best will in the world, we we do become stiff and we do become frail and we do become old and old age never comes alone. And, and we, we experience frustration and that frustration one day will become a freedom when our bodies are redeemed. And uh, we could say a bit more about that, but there's a, a third heading that I want us to get onto. And that is, that is how we wait. This is 24 and 25. Uh, put them on the screen for you again. In this hope, we were saved. That's to say what he's just been talking about, the, uh, uh, the redemption of our bodies. In this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now, I've put on the screen for you here that the way in which we hope is twofold. We wait, first of all, expectantly, because it is in this hope that we were saved. That's what we were made for. That's what God will effect in us. And that's what, what, what God has shifted all of heaven to secure for us in order that we might indeed at last be that that's what it is to be saved. It's not simply to be forgiven. It's not simply to know that Jesus is kind of with us day by day in our lives. It is this big. It is being brought to enjoy at last a whole universe that has been renewed where there is nothing out of place. A world that is marked by that utter, complete, total, comprehensive righteousness of God. Everything made right. Everything uh, aglow. Everything full of the splendor and glory and beauty and brightness of the living God. That's what we're saved to be a part of and fitted to be able to enjoy it. 
made whole, made whole in body and in spirit, so that we are no longer always uh, falling short because of temptation. There will be no more sin. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more pain. There will be no more tears. There will be no more death. None of that at all. No regrets, no uh, nothing that is going to interfere, nothing that is going to harm and pinch on the joy, the splendor, the beauty, the loveliness of it. We will be at last made perfect. We will be able to serve God with all our being, able to enjoy God, able to sound out the praise of God, to share with the whole company of God's people in a way that we have never countenanced before, able to see as we have never seen before, see the glory and the splendor and the beauty of our Savior who has died. That's what he came to do. That's what Jesus came into this world to secure for us. That's why he was born. That's why he lived as he did. That's why he faced the, the temptations in the wilderness and stirred up that he might be one who lived a life of perfect obedience on our behalf. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he bore the agony and the darkness of the cross. That's why he was dead and buried in the tomb. And that's why he was raised to life and ascended on high in order that you and I might be saved like that that we might enjoy that, and that's why we are expectant. Because if God has already poured that much to invest that much in that salvation, you and I may be pretty sure that's what's coming. And it's that big. It, it's something to which God has, has invested everything that heaven has, the very best, in order to secure that for us. In this hope, you are saved. Not just for the here and now, but for that, that which is so big, that glory that is still to come, a new world that is, is marked by righteousness, a new body, and a new enjoyment of the living God in the person of his Son beyond all measure. So we wait expectantly. It's coming. And we wait patiently. That eager expectation that is shared by the whole of creation is one that we have, but we also therefore wait patiently. And we wait patiently because of these two things. First, God has promised. God has gone down in black and white on any number of occasions to say, this is what I'm doing. And it's, it's not an occasional chance, random comment that God flings in. It is a clear, categorical promise that is made by God. That's what I'm committed to doing. And this God who makes these promises, he never, ever lies. He never, ever fails to come good on the promises that he has made. Joshua, at the end of his life, chapter 23 of the book of Joshua, that's what he's saying. He said, I, Joshua lived 110 years, so he's got a lot of experience behind him. He's, he's been in Egypt. He'd been a slave in Egypt. He'd seen the way God has delivered his people out of Egypt. Seen the way God led them through the Red Sea, the way that God provided for them in the wilderness through all those 40 years, the way that God brought them across the River Jordan into the land of, of promise. All, all of that on the 110 years, and he is able, at the end of that, to say, not a single one of all the promises that God has made, has failed of fulfillment. He is the God who fulfills his promises. You can trust him. And when God promises that that's what he will do, you may be 100% sure that's what he will do. However unlikely it looks, however long it may seem to you to take, that's what he will do. You can trust him for that because when God makes a promise, then he fulfills on it. The, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 6, highlights this. God not only makes a promise, but he confirms that promise with an oath in order to, to underline the, the, the certainty of that. Not just a promise that should be sufficient in itself, but a promise with an oath from God himself. That's how sure it is. And that's why we wait for it patiently. We, we, we know it's coming. We'd, we'd love to have it sooner rather than later, but, but it is coming and we wait for it patiently. And we wait not only uh, in that way patiently because of what God has promised, but because of what God has proved already. He has demonstrated already in the person of Jesus his capacity to do exactly that. He is able to raise a body that is dead from the tomb. 
and Jesus is fully, utterly, completely dead. He is crucified, nailed to that cross, bears in his own body the consequences of our wrongdoing, and that body that is pierced by a spear and blood and water flow out, and that phenomenon only happens in a very limited set of circumstances where a person has been kind of asphyxiated in that way and has died suddenly in that context. The blood and the water come out, he is dead, and he is buried in a tomb, and God raises that body from the dead. That's who he is, that's what he does. And every single Sunday when we come here, on a Sunday it is for God to remind us, that's who I am and that's what I do. I am the resurrecting God. Don't ever forget that. However bleak it may seem to you, your circumstances, however dark, however difficult, however hopeless and dead your situation may be, don't ever forget I'm the God who raises the dead. There's, uh, there's a, a great sermon that was preached long before most of you were alive. In fact, probably long before any of you were alive. In fact, definitely before any of you were alive. It was preached in 1913 by a guy called um, Lockridge. Um, he was a pastor in America. A very simple sermon. I think the original sermon was about three minutes. You're thinking, wow, give us a, give us a preacher like that, please. Um, and it had a kind of single line, basically. And, and some of you will, will know this sermon. Not because you were there, probably, um, because you're not that old, but be, because you've, you've heard it or heard of it. And the single line that runs through it is simply, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Now, this guy was, was a kind of Pentecostal preacher, so he, he kind of knew how to, how to, to kind of take a line and, and really manage that line and handle that line and sing that line and sound that line and preach that line. And boy, the guy preached the line. He was an kind of African-American guy who, who had a, a lovely deep voice. And, and he, he just kind of started soft and, and gentle. It's Friday. And he, he kind of pins up all that was going on on that Friday when the world seemed pretty black and pretty bleak and it all seemed pretty desperate. And he, he does it in a kind of rhythmic way that, uh, you know, there's, uh, um, uh, Jesus is a praying and Peter is, uh, is a sleeping and uh, Judas is betraying and builds up the scene there. And then, then Mary is weeping and the disciples are running away and, and uh, uh, Jesus is, is then nailed to the cross and it seems utterly hopeless at that point. There is, there is no coming back from that at all. And, and some of it is, is kind of rhyming. The, people's, uh, the people are, 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 are sinning and the world is winning and, and sin is grinning and, uh, and Satan is having a laugh. And, and all the time he kind of punctuated it, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Friday, but Sunday's coming. And he, he kind of builds it up like that all the way through and, and then begins to outline some of the things in, in your life and in our lives that are, are bad, the present sufferings. And it looks pretty bleak. And, uh, you know, you've been, you've been applying for a job for how many weeks and how many months and how many years and you've got nothing. It is all dark. It is all bleak. There is war going on in Ukraine. There is war going on in Gaza. There is war going on in different parts of the world. There's poverty here. There's cruelty there. It's Friday. It's Friday and it's all black and it's all dark and it's all bleak and it's all somber like that. But Sundays are coming. Sunday is coming. Don't ever forget that, that, that Sunday is coming. And you hold on to that on the Friday. You hold on to the fact it's only Friday. Sunday is coming. And, and that, in a sense, is, is what the whole Bible is saying to you and to me always. It's Friday. Yes, I know, says the Lord, it is hard. I know that it's sore. I know that it's throbbing. I know that it's swollen up. I know that there is poison there in your body. But, but hang on in there. Keep on believing. Trust me, Sunday is coming. That day of resurrection is coming. And our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And, and so hang on in there. Wait for that. That's, that's what's coming. And so you wait expectantly. And you wait patiently because it is coming. And however bleak and however dark the present may be, you hold on to that. Uh, whoever you are this morning. That's what Jesus has come to secure for all who trust in him. No matter what baggage you may carry, no matter how much you may have messed up in the past, no matter what the past may be, no matter what may be going on presently in your life, you trust in him, you place yourself in him, and he says, now, I'm come, I've come to take you home. That's where we're going. That's where we're headed. Sunday is coming. May God bless his word to all our hearts. Father, thank you for 
for the promise of Scripture. Thank you for the, the rich, glorious, pulsing promise that you have made to us. Thank you for, for all that is held out to us. Would you help us when things are dark and difficult and bleak and we, we wonder really whether, whether you even notice, whether you even care? Would you help us simply to keep on believing, trusting that a Friday is, is going to be followed by a Sunday and that you will indeed put things to right? Hasten that day, Lord, we pray, please, and meet us in our need for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Well, as we close our worship this morning, let's join to sing together the, uh, the song, There is a hope that burns within my heart. Go then in peace to love and to serve the Lord, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.